Hi, it's Jonathan. Why don't people know anything? Why do the people think they know things and talk about how others don't know anything? Why is it so easy to get people to call other people sheep? Is that not just a new underground pop thing to say? You have homophobia, this could be sheepophobia. Everybody calls everybody else a sheep. They talk about how they're awake. People believe that if they watch a six-hour video by David Icke, or watch Endgame by Alex Jones, or study the Illuminati online, they believe that after doing so, that that has anything, in any way, to do with being awake. They believe it. I'm not kidding. They can't get enough. Addicted to posting their opinion in a forum. Chasing that white rabbit everywhere it goes. And they call themselves awake because the system wants you to call yourself awake. It loves that. Cockiness, arrogance, and hating other people. And as you're sucked into this, it is consuming you and you don't know it. You don't even realize it. You just prefer to be able to call people sheep. Perhaps subconsciously you resent that you were called a sheep. You want to be able to say it too. The naivety with that is that you don't know anything that they know. And they know you don't know it. You're not hurting their feelings. You're making them laugh at you. Because you're eating up mostly propaganda that they have distributed. Calling yourself awake and pointing your finger at them. And you are hardly enabled to deal with them or even your own self. John, tell me why. John, give me, give me, give me. John, tell me another answer, please. And can you answer this question for me? And what's your opinion on that? You owe me a response. I owe you a response? How much am I getting paid to do this? Oh, that's right. Nothing. I couldn't even count the number of people that have declared being awake to me. Couldn't do it. People are very easily controlled. All they have to do is create a new subcategory of personalities. Right now you have the jocks, you have the rednecks, you have the goth, you have the preppies, you have the business people and the whatever. Now they have the awake people. The reason nobody knows anything can only be explained to you by a metaphor, of course. In this realm, you can only use metaphor. Think of the difference between a broadband connection and a 56K connection. Now, there are people that know what is occurring in this reality. Many of them joined secret societies. So it's not that they have knowledge, it's just that they have acquired information. They went in reverse. You see, true knowledge is true knowledge. Those with understanding understand what I just said. Those without don't. It's pre-symbol. A symbol is no different than any expression, a song, a picture, a sound, a look, a touch. A symbol should be the result of knowledge. The understanding, the awareness, and then you have the symbol surface. Maybe that symbol has already been expressed, but it's irrelevant because the symbol that you're perceiving in your mind is a result. Having somebody learn symbols and then distributing a very strategically limited amount of meaning to that person does not give them knowledge. They perceive that they're getting knowledge. I'll tell you what a pentagram means and what a hexagram means. It doesn't mean anything. For example, I could say the word gum to some bubblegum-popping, dizzy-minded cheerleader. 
And the only meaning that she may come up with when she hears that word is chewing gum. I could say the same word, gum, to somebody else, and they may think chewing gum, but they could also think a gum tree, or the gums around your teeth. could say it to another person, they'll think chewing gum, a gum tree, gums around your teeth, but maybe they're thinking even deeper, maybe they have a deeper understanding. Metaphorical comparison to other things, gummy substances used in construction, maybe molecular assessment. I only used one word a phonetic symbol, written if you're looking at it. The meaning transferred by using that symbol is directly dependent upon who is receiving the information. If it's the cheerleader, she's only going to get a very limited amount of understanding, just enough to communicate. The line by Gene Hackman in The First Superman, some people can extract the secrets of the universe just by looking at the ingredients on a chewing gum wrapper is absolutely correct. What that means is you can get a lot of information just by being aware. The creases in the paper, the spacing between the letters, the letters themselves, the space around the letters, all the nuances. Now, unfortunately, I have to say that this is a metaphor, okay? A metaphor. That does not mean that you should go and try to learn as many meanings as you can for each word that you know. That would have nothing to do with anything. That was just a metaphor that I used. If you think of a symbol, and you look at maybe the shape of the number six, you can be told what that means. But perhaps if you're bathing in knowledge and awareness in life, suddenly you have an understanding and then a symbol like six comes up maybe you think of getting caught in a tumor and you come in but you can't get out and you're caught in a vortex a circular cyclic existence getting in not getting out something like that you know what they do to you early is they show you all the symbols and tell you what they mean and they don't tell you completely what they mean, of course. They tell you what they want you to think they mean. Why? Because what is the true purpose of being? Before you incarnate, you are. You would say, I am. When you do, you become your being. What is the purpose of that? If you're not extracting meaning from your path, from your experience, deriving meaning from it, in creating expression, the expression would always be the symbolic. A picture, a touch, a kiss, anything, an image, right? If you're only copying what they've told you things mean, and replicating what they've told you to use them for and how to use them, how to speak, how to think, what means what, what you're supposed to do, what the meaning of your life is. If you allow yourself to be told what the meaning of your life is by something in your objective reality, somebody else, what is your purpose other than to be a slave? Forget about laws and politics, that's all bull. That's only a result. If you're not creating, and the only way you're going to create is by extracting meaning from within, if you can't do that, what is the point of you being around other than to be a slave? Acquiring detail. This means this. I learned what this symbol means. This pagan symbol means this. What do you mean you learned? Did you look it up? Were you told, or did you read what it means? Or did you sit there by a lake and think about life as a whole and what's happening, and the symbol came up and you're like, oh my gosh. See, the oh my gosh is when you extract meaning. It doesn't have to be a traumatic thing, like oh my gosh. It can be, oh my God. <gasps> that is the sign of a creative. Somebody that's always in their mind like, I get it, oh my gosh, and you want to tell the whole world. Because you've just created, you've extracted meaning from within. 
those that even if they have opened up, all right, and they were seeking information, because information is not knowledge. So enlightenment would be in the category of information. Why? Because as it's sold, as it ends up being, all you're doing is changing your perception of reality, just seeing other templates of symbolic expression. There are no answers there if you're depending upon anything you experience to give you those answers. No symbol means anything until you give it meaning. So in truth, if you have the meaning inside and you come up with symbols and you see them in your objective reality, maybe somebody else came up with it too, you have an understanding, an immediate understanding. Sometimes that can be faked or replicated. Somebody's been indoctrinated into a system where they had to learn specific meanings to symbols, and so one who is in the know, one who has knowledge, may run into somebody like that, and the person may have learned enough so that you have an understanding. But the person that learned it will still look at you if you came from within to know in a way that, that they're curious. How do you know? Because you seem to have a different, uh, a fuller understanding of it, a non-polarized understanding of it. They learn a few specific ways to talk about it and what it means, but you can talk about it endlessly with different metaphors. What's the difference? Well, what's the difference between reading a book and memorizing somebody else's conclusions and extracting meaning and coming to your own. It's like the difference between a muffin top and a muffin. They've got you all eating up muffin tops, but you don't have the knowledge underneath. Is that a permanent thing? Absolutely not. The reason you don't know anything is because many people that do have knowledge even if they wanted to tell you, it's like they are on a broadband connection and you're on 56K. There is so much information. And unfortunately, as it is right now, the general population has no idea. They look at a symbol. Maybe they're taught a symbol. Either they really don't have any understanding of it, or it's a very limited understanding. If you have knowledge inside of you, you could sit there and talk about that one symbol all day. There's more than one meaning attached to symbols. Like I told you, a deer in the woods can mean more than one thing by stomping their hoof. If you seek the symbol, the muffin top, you will never have the whole muffin. And this is what people do when they try to seek videos and books and all. They're looking for muffin tops. They're looking for the end result. Therefore, you are dependent upon the meaning that is given to you. So somebody in the know, if they're talking to somebody that isn't in the know, can be very difficult. Why? Well, a very naive thing to say. Or if somebody's trying to manipulate you, control your mind... They'll say this, the truth is an easy thing to say. And anybody who speaks for a long time to you, they're trying to manipulate you. Now that's a very naive thing to say. Yes, somebody who depends upon a lot of words, really trying to control what you're thinking, could very well be trying to manipulate you. But if you depend upon length of speech, and that's where your perception lies, you wouldn't be able to tell anyway. If someone's trying to manipulate you, you should pick up on that within seconds, regardless of what they're saying. The truth is something easy to say. If one person in the know is speaking to another person in the know. In other words, you've both reached the same conclusions and you know it. You know when other people know. You just do. That's why they don't say anything other than that. You know when other people know. And you say, well, that's ambiguous. And that's ambiguous to you. But that is a symbol. To say that sentence, you know when other people know, that is a symbol. And those who have come to the conclusion on their own understand the full meaning of that. 
those who may have heard that from some philosopher and they were told that that philosopher was brilliant so they decided to dwell upon things the philosopher said if a philosopher says to you you just know you just know when other people know well you trust that philosopher because everybody has given them a five-star rating so you think well that must mean something so I'm gonna sit around and think about it you can't sit around and think about that that is a result of so much so many experiences so if I say you just know when other people know you don't have to sit around and assess and calculate in your mind and think of behavioral patterns or they said this and they said that I'm going to put two and two together and formulate an assessment of them and what their intentions are if you are doing that that is robotic it's nothing against you if I were against you I wouldn't be trying to help it's the conclusion that matters if you reach it on your own because a conclusion is a symbol it is a symbolic representation the quote the conclusion that has so much attached to it all of your experiences that tie in to the conclusion how do you extract meaning well perhaps you have an experience it could be a social experience it could be anything and that experience is finished and that means nothing to you then you have another experience and you see that it's different but there's something similar to that other experience you're kinda of like hmm and then you have a third experience in your life and it's really similar now all three of them then you have a fourth experience that solidifies the similarity and prompts a question it is the fourth experience that prompted you to ask the question but it required the other three preceding it the fourth experience if it were isolated in and of itself would never have prompted it you needed all four experiences so now you have the question and maybe you have a whole other series of experiences that are happening so that you can extract meaning to address the question and maybe after all of that you come to a conclusion and now that conclusion propels you in your advancement of understanding and extracting meaning in your life and you start a whole other series of experiences and that's just one facet of your life and maybe simultaneously you have 30 other paths going like that like I just explained and maybe all 30 of them come to one peak of a conclusion and you need it all 30 paths that had many many experiences within each path leading up to minute conclusions that come together that lead you to a new understanding that takes time it takes attentiveness and the desire to have meaning to have purpose and now that one new understanding could be one of thousands that eventually tie in and you don't even know it right until you reach the <gasps> the oh my gosh and all of these things come from within your ability to make use of pattern recognition to see how things are always and never the same what do they have in common did you get out there and experience people of different cultures were you too busy trying to project your culture onto them and see what they would say or were you trying to figure out what you had in common? I did that my whole life. In the moment of doing it, I didn't really necessarily know why I was motivated to do it. My spirit did, but my conscious mind didn't. Your spirit will lay breadcrumbs for you throughout your entire life or path. So if you come to an understanding, and then several understandings, and you know how much is involved with it you can tell other people the details of your path but that isn't their path and if they try to memorize the details of your path they're pulled off of their path this is why I have been really careful not to give too much information about my path people always ask me tell me how this all began tell me more about your dealings with entities well hold on a second what if that isn't your path in the details of my path are irrelevant the understanding 
is the important thing, the conclusions I reach. And I can share conclusions with you to motivate you. But I can't have you memorize my conclusion. So I have to have a delicate balance of rhetoric with the information. And the information is not volumes of information. It's enough to make my point clear. It's enough to show you that I've learned. But I don't want you to memorize the details of my life. One who really cares for you will be attentive to that. And the idea of indoctrinating somebody with an oath is absolute evil. Why? Because they're declaring they do not want you to be a creative being and extract your own meaning. You will go through steps in which they will spoon feed you meaning. And because it's more meaning than you had before, more knowledge, you're really impressed by it. You think you're actually getting something. You think that you're being empowered. When they know that by keeping you from being able to extract meaning on your own, they've got complete control over you. They've pulled you off of your path. But if they did that successfully, you would never even have thought of that, now would you? because you won't extract your own meaning, you see. Nevertheless, somebody with a lot of knowledge, if they're on a broadband connection and they're speaking to somebody in a 56K connection, it's anything but easy to tell the truth. Like I said before, one in the know can say the truth very easily to another in the know. If one in the know is speaking to an individual that is not in the know, saying the truth is anything but easy. Why? Because of what you know, you know of the enormous gaps that they have. That you cannot just say the truth because they'll understand the words with the limited understanding they have in their concept building by society, but they would need to go through so much. And you know that they don't believe that. Telling them that makes no sense to them. They say, the truth is simple, you should be able to give me a simple answer. And then what happens is the people that have knowledge get very frustrated. The very moment you interrupt them, or cut off what they're saying to you when they have to extend great patience to try to tell you the truth, and you cut them off and want to give them your opinion, or you tell them that you agree with them or disagree, to somebody in the know, when they're speaking to somebody that is not in the know, when the person that is not in the know says that they agree or disagree, both of those things are offensive. Because they know you should just have your mouth shut and take in what they're saying, and a lot of what they're saying will be rhetoric. But I talk to people like this all the time. They completely ignore the rhetoric. I'll use rhetoric. That if they had wisdom, they would understand at least, okay, there's something with this. And they blow it off. They go, yeah, but anyway, but I, and then I blow them off. And they have no idea why I blew them off. Or people will just bombard me with questions. Questions that are what you call loaded. Anybody in the know would say that's a loaded question. Because you lack, you lack so much just in the fact that you're asking those questions shows how much you don't know. And you ask them in a very naive way. It's not your fault, but you expect a simple answer. People will go up to somebody with knowledge that has required an entire lifetime of attentive awareness to their experiences, detailed and disciplined effort, to extract meaning from your life and they ask you a simple question and expect somehow that you are going to be able to transfer a lifetime of understanding in two or three paragraphs they truly do they do expect that otherwise they wouldn't ask the question so you have this huge gap between those who are in the know and those who are not in the know. Those who are not in the know do not know they're not in the know because of how they have been taught to think. They have been incorrectly instructed 
in their thinking process itself. They have been taught to look outside of themselves for answers. They have been misinformed about what answers are because they've spent their whole life having the meaning spoon-fed to them. They think that's how it works. So you ask a question and somebody can spoon-feed you the answer. And because you lack any meaning or an understanding, you don't understand why that answer is wrong, limited, or even misleading you. You can't based upon that, based upon how you've been instructed to think. So a lot of people that have knowledge, when they interact with the average person, they get very, very frustrated. Very. They'll just look at you. All they can do is look at you because they can't say anything to you. You would not be able to extract meaning from what they say. They said gum all you would do is hear chewing gum and they're thinking 500 different meanings to gum all leading up to a point of conclusion if you lack that it's a waste of time to tell you anything this is why when you hear someone tell you that you cannot be told the truth this is why so they'll look at you and they'll have that look and those in the know understand that look it's a look that says you know so little you know absolutely nothing and don't know it to tell you what I know I would need 500 mouths and have to be able to speak 500 different sentences simultaneously all at the same time to express what I know and you would have to be able to interpret 500 simultaneous sentences flowing at you at once that's what that look says. And the look also says you don't even know that. And if I told you that, you would call me arrogant because you've been trained to call people arrogant. You don't even know what that means. So they'll just sit there and shake their head at you. They shake their head from side to side because they're paralyzed. It's the questions you ask the way that you ask the questions and what you do if they actually try to answer them how long does it take before you cut them off roll your eyes or get distracted by something that occurs in the room like a cat being distracted by bright and shiny objects and if they're trying to tell you something and maybe your cell phone will ring and you'll tell the person trying to give you truth to hang on Shelly has to talk about her boyfriend okay hey you're not going to get the truth. You're nowhere near prepared to even comprehend anything that is true. And then you say, come on, just tell me. You can't be told. Well, that doesn't make sense. All you have to do is tell me. You can't be told. Not in your current state. You need a lot of work. And you don't understand why you need a lot of work. That's what it comes down to. Now, nothing is 100%. Am I saying that every Freemason has been spoon-fed? No, there's a lot of intuitive people that probably joined that. But they were naive enough to be sucked in. But some of these people may want to tell the world things. Maybe they thought, you know, this isn't fair. i, I got to tell them what's going on. And they tried. Maybe they tried with a few people, but they got the rolling of the eyes. Or the person that they knew, knew nothing, tried to debate them. They're so far out of the know that they can't even recognize truth when it's told to them. Do you know that the majority of the people that look up information on the Illuminati point their fingers at people in the Illuminati? If you actually sat down in a room with these people, and were allowed to ask them questions and they had to be honest with you if they told you the truth you either wouldn't understand or you would roll your eyes you would laugh at them I know enough to know that a problem with somebody in an organization like that is not only are they separated from you they're separated from you because they cannot relate to you 
because what you think is is not what they think is that's first and foremost and that's by design by that which sucked them into it they're also controlled by an oath with fear and it's not just fear of death they'll use threats of the unknown because these people are shown different templates of reality and they say we control that too so if you do this it's not over when you die we'll get you here here and here and they don't know any difference they can't prove that that isn't happening that that won't happen that's the fear of the unknown when are you subjected to the fear of the unknown when you look outside of yourself for meaning they are answering to a consciousness that overwhelms them it can speak through anyone they know it if they want to ask it a question they can look in a cloud so that can be overwhelming for them and I understand that my intent is not to point my finger at anybody or anything on any scale I don't have a goal because in eternity there is no end so how could I let the end justify my means that would be a backwards cancerous approach that's the same thing as looking for a symbol first and then trying to learn the meaning there is no end in eternity so how can that possibly justify your intent now to try to seek some goal or worry about whether you will succeed or fail once you are thinking about that you corrupt your means let your means be your means in any given moment to feel and express the truth to see what gives you joy what makes you feel alive not elated I'm not talking about pleasure or manic behavior I'm talking about calm meaning to your life when you give and you feel what you feel you cannot let whether you think you're gonna fail or succeed drive or motivate your expression now if your expression is the correct one of truth of spirit you have to trust that the results will always be the correct one if your expression is the right expression your perception of any result will be a correct result the people in these societies are sucked in then they're blackmailed because even though they believe they have all of this knowledge some of it is filtered in their mind by the consciousness that controls their minds so they don't think about certain things controlling of their mind to make them deviate in a way that society would want to pick up stones and throw them at them because society is corrupt too that's why they're so judgmental these people are scared of that type of persecution I understand that I'm not gonna point my finger at them for being scared of it rather I would like to go through it in some ways myself and show them that it's worth it and show them their own value I want to show everybody value I'm not polarized here because that's what's in my heart if I feel like a healer how could I look at somebody with a disease and just focus on their behavior and be too stupid to recognize that their behavior is a result of a condition now if I have true wisdom wouldn't I address the condition I would only focus on somebody's conduct throughout their life if I had a very small mind and had no capabilities no abilities no talent no gift to give no ability to create my desire is to heal both myself and everything I see and not carry the whole world on my shoulders when I do it but rather be moment to moment since everybody else is ignoring the problem the majority and I say wait a minute you know that person doesn't have to be that way they don't have to be corrupt and I know it because I've watched my own corruption get healed so if it can happen for me I know it can happen for somebody else I would be what you call a fool you know the one that comes in with the hat and the bells I would be a fool 
to blind myself to the whole picture and not take everything into account. That includes my own behavior, my own path, because that's where I'm going to get any knowledge from anyway. Which is why I told you before, I can't give you too much detail about my path. I don't want to lead you from your path. It's the knowledge that matters. A lot of it has to be rhetoric or just guidance. Putting two and two together but without details that you're going to memorize. I don't want to tell you anything. I want to show you. And all I can show you is what I've experienced. I have no interest in reading something here, watching something there, and then making a video about it. Why? That's not me. That's not my creation. The other people already did it. I don't need to do that. If I do do that, I'm just taking up space anyway. I'm a repeater. If I can't add to something, then I have no reason to be talking about it. I've been walking a path where I've been forcing myself to extract meaning and it's a struggle at first but the more you do that the more you make yourself put two and two together from your own life the better you get at it and the quicker the information comes I promise you don't discourage yourself because you can't extract meaning the first month that's like I said before you pick up a guitar and you think you're gonna play like Eric Clapton and you can't so you think ah screw it and you put it down will you you're out of your mind to think that in the beginning you've got to put some effort in some people they don't even listen all the way through my videos they listen to the first four parts and then they question me then they send me questions because they have no attention span and they're not driven correctly they want immediate gratification as they've been trained to want it they don't put in the effort to listen to the whole thing and had they listened to the whole thing they never would have bothered me with their questions because they would have seen they would have gotten the answer they were looking for if they listened all the way through this type of impatience is by design anybody that's been indoctrinated into this stuff doesn't tell you what's going on but it's not just because of secrecy you've got to see the whole picture they know how much you don't know and they would get tongue-tied trying to tell you because they know how you are programmed once you see the truth you see how everybody is programmed and it's that programming that they use to try to perceive their reality and the programming is wrong the way they're looking at things is wrong completely wrong how you are resolving images even and they don't know how wrong it is so you get tongue-tied maybe you just write clever lyrics you become an artist because you don't know how to tell people you just don't know how right for those of you that know what I'm talking about you get tongue-tied so what is needed what am I doing I'm doing what I can but I have had a path you see as we all have had a path and your path is where all of your answers are every person listening to me right now for what you need do you hear what I'm saying what you need as an individual to know yourself to know what you need to know you've already been shown and don't ever let anybody tell you that it's too late as long as your memory works I don't care if you didn't extract meaning from your experiences while they happened what are you going to do quit say it's too late if you can remember your experiences you can sit by yourself on a couch in the woods without any input from anybody and think it through what has your life been showing you pattern recognition is the most important tool it is the spirit that guides that ability now this is very important hear me on this so that you people understand something do not objectify the spirit 
When I say objectify, that means an object or thing outside of yourself. Some God watching you, looking down on you. Don't do that. You're tempted to do that. You want its help, right? You can't perceive the Spirit. No matter how hard you try, you're not going to be able to do that. And as soon as you objectify it as a deity or something that is trying to help you from outside of you, you get into real trouble. Why? Because that can now be debated. If you're going to put the author of life outside of yourself, that means you're looking outside of yourself for meaning. Therefore, debates are also outside of yourself. So one day, you may be really faithful. You may feel so much confidence in God. And then this reality and that which controls it coordinates things so that you run into debates and information and videos or your own thoughts that negate the objectivity of this God. And now your addictions rise again, your negative feelings rise again, you become in denial again. Of course. Why are you looking for a source? What should your faith be in then? What is your choice? Well, you can either choose observable lies you observe lies every day in your world. You can choose to adhere to those and be allegiant to lies because you can observe them. Or you can be allegiant and adhere to the unobservable truth. The truth is not in debate and it certainly is not of the mind. You feel the truth. Meaning, say the hunting of deer does something horrible to your heart when you think about it, that humans have actually gotten to the point where they'll take weapons and kill an innocent vegetarian animal and call it a sport. And just because the entire world reinforces that, if you submit to that norm, then what are you doing other than killing your soul? Just because your reality doesn't confirm what you feel is correct inside doesn't mean that you should adhere to the observable lies or your reality or the norm it's got to come from somewhere right your feeling I don't care if your reality confirms it do you hear what I'm saying to you I wouldn't say this lightly or without certainty I have had a path You've got to trust that my knowledge has come from that path. Whether you know what that path is or not, you must hear me now. If you feel what is correct inside, it's got to come from somewhere, but you don't need to trace the source. And believe me, the source is unconcerned right now with you doing that. You've got to trust me on that. You've got to go with what you feel is right. If you have a job and you know... You're like, God, I'm forced to lie in my job. And the lies are starting to really get to me. And everybody at work, they don't even seem concerned about it. And I complain about it and people say, well, you got to make money. But something inside me says, this is wrong. I don't know exactly why it's wrong. Or maybe I don't have the total understanding. Because nobody else in this reality or very few people in this reality seem to confirm it. And I know I can't function the way I used to if I go from it, but something inside that's not of the academic system, not of the media, not of the norm, is telling me this is wrong. And you ignore that to submit to the observable lie that's killing your spirit. Don't believe me? Follow your feeling. Honor it and see how you feel. I had my own business, my own clinic. Making six figures was easy for me. I walked away from it all, and I couldn't have been solicited to do so. I couldn't have heard somebody talk about it to motivate me to do that. It's something that slowly occurred inside. I got tired of charging. I felt, even though I was very good at what I did, and people chose me. They drove from other states to come see me, bypassing their local health care. 
I realized I'm not solving their problem. It may appear that way, but all I'm doing is moving it. I'm moving it to a financial problem. They shouldn't have to pay for this. They shouldn't have to pay for my time. So I decided to lower prices. Extremely lower them. And I got heat from the state board. Because they didn't want all the other crooks to have to lower their prices too. It got to the point where I didn't even care if I could afford to pay rent at my office. I'd just go to their home if I had to because I felt alive. This came from within me, not some video that I saw one day. My whole life, looking back on my whole life, what made me happy, what didn't? What are my gifts? How did I affect people positively and how did I affect them negatively? Putting all of these things together, looking inward. Everything you need has been in your individual path. You've got to trust me on that. It's not in a 9-11 propaganda video. That may catalyze you to shake up your paradigm, which in some cases may be good, but if you magnetically bond yourself to it, now you're way off your path. I closed down my business to do this for free. People ask what the wake-up is. That is the wake-up. When you dramatically change your life because of conclusions that you come to from the extraction of meaning, understandings you've gained from your life, meaning you don't need another person's opinion to come to these conclusions, and they ring true with your heart. The unobservable truth that you feel, regardless of the source, don't bother trying to find the source. It's unnecessary right now. Do not objectify God. You don't need to do that. And it doesn't need you to do that. You've got to trust me on that. Your spirit's in you. It's been laying breadcrumbs down for you your whole life. It's not too late. Those breadcrumbs are still there. But you've got to want to do it. How do you begin to want to do it? By putting two and two together. You don't need to put two and two together necessarily of all this information you're being flooded with. You need to look inside. Everything I tell you has come from my path. I address other situations. Do you know, I don't like to talk about the New World Order. I don't like to talk about mind control. I don't like to talk about entities or the all-seeing eye. Because that isn't of me. It has nothing to do with me or what makes me me. That's why I don't like to talk about it. Why do I? Because it just happens to be something that is keeping all of you from knowing yourself. So unfortunately, I have to address it. And I'll address it in a broad recording like this, but day to day when I meet different people, I don't go up and talk about the New World Order to everybody. And that's another thing, people. I get a lot of people, John, how do you handle these entities? I'm starting to open up my psyche and, and you know, they're doing these things to me. Suck it up. I don't know what to say other than that. I mean, I get a lot of resistance on my path. I do. Some of it really, really sucks, but you know what? I'm not a paraplegic in a wheelchair that needs to blow in a straw just to get around the block. And I include that into my understanding of my life. I don't censor it so I can be a martyr. There are a lot of people that have it a lot, and I mean a lot worse than I do different types of interference in their life. I have a different type of resistance. But I'm not, like I said, blowing in a straw. I'm not somebody that has chronic debilitating back pain where I can't even stand up and I have trouble falling asleep because of that. There are people that have it worse than you. The girl that I showed you in the beginning of the next phase video, I'm not her. Why would I set that video up that way? 
I wanted you people to see how quickly you get emotional. And then you were emotional, you wanted to defend her, and right away did you point your finger at the Illuminati, forgetting about the beam in your eye. I mean, what is it you think you're going to do? Overcome them with wrong-mindedness, without knowledge? How long would it take before you would do the same thing they're doing, whether you think you would right now or not? If you actually overcame that and became the new controllers of a hierarchy, how long would it be before you decided that because you're in control, you have to make some decisions about humanity and don't think you would avoid the all-seeing eye? If you rose up to that level, you'd have a little meaning. You point your finger and you don't know what you're pointing at. If I had to paint a picture of collective humanity, a giant portrait, it would be billions of people all with their arms extended outward pointing at somebody else. That's the image of cancer. The sound of cancer is noise. I'm right, you're wrong, I'm right, you're wrong. The majority of people, if you say black, they say white. When their integrity is on the line, they defend lies. It's a knee-jerk reaction based upon everything that they've been fed through the media and school. It's no one's fault, but it needs to be understood. Anyway, the reason that none of you know anything is because those in the know don't know how to tell you, and they lack the patience. This is the crucial thing, because they are not motivated by spirit, yet they don't have the patience. So they become overwhelmed. Let me give you an idea of what I mean by that. Part of my path has given me this perspective. If I looked outside of my path for the answers, I could never help you in the way that I'm helping you now. Just like if you try to memorize my path, you can't help anybody. So why do I even bother talking to you? Because it's not my path that matters. It's showing you how I have taken from my path so that you begin to do the same thing for yourself. I remember when I was 19 and I had a really busy semester in college and had all these final exams and I'd actually skipped a lot of the classes in human physiology. This was going to be our biggest exam, the final exam for human physiology. Five chapters. And if you're thinking, oh, five chapters is easy, well, this isn't just memorizing. When you get up to the level we were at, you have to be able to assimilate. You have to be able to put two and two together. You're not going to cut it just by memorizing. So studying involves going through that process of linking things. I didn't even begin to study. I was blowing that off because I was doing other things. And as a pre-medical student, you're very concerned about your grades. So I was freaking out. I'd done very well up to that point. The exam was the next day. I sit down, it's like 2 in the afternoon, and I look at the outline for what I need to know. I have an inch thick of handouts. I'm not going to exaggerate that and say it was 3 inches. It was about an inch. Five chapters. And I look at the outline, two-page outline, of what I need to know. The whole thing looked like Chinese. All of it. I didn't understand any of it. And I knew I had to know it the next morning. I tried opening up the book and reading, and I was so anxious I'd read a paragraph and forget what I just read. I'd have to reread it and then read it again. I was looking at everything. I went through all the handouts one by one, and I was looking at everything at once in a state of anxiety. I was overwhelmed. I went into the other room where my dad was, and he's a professor, but not in science, so he didn't understand it either. But I handed him the outline in a panic. I said, Dad, this is too much. I fucked up. I'm, oh, the whole semester is a failure. I can't do it. And he looked at it, and he looked at me. He handed it right back to me. He says, what can you do? <laughs> what do you mean? He said, what can you do? 
You can only do what you can do. All you can do is the best that you can do. Nobody can ever ask you to do more than your best effort. You're in a situation you can't change that now. So you can either collapse and look at the whole thing at once, or you can take it one step at a time. Better you learn one chapter well than look at all five chapters and all the handouts at once and retain nothing. Slow down. Calm down. Take it one step at a time. I said, all right. So I went back to the chair and I put earplugs in. I put the outline out of sight and I turned to page one. I slowed down and forgot about the exam and just read it like I wanted to read it slowly. And I began reading. At 2.30 in the morning, I'd gotten through all of the chapters, all of the handouts, and I grabbed that outline and looked at it again. And I went down the list. One by one, I realized I knew everything on the outline. By the time I got to the end of the outline, I was freaking out. I knew it all. And I had about 90% recall the next day. I jumped onto my chair and woke my dad up. I'm like, Dad, I know it. I know it. He opens his eyes. He looks at me. He says, yeah, I knew you would. Go to bed. Why did he know I would? He already had that particular wisdom. I acquired that wisdom by going through the path. He couldn't do it for me. I could have either trusted his advice or not. Same thing as what I told you about how you cannot focus on whether you will fail or succeed, you see. How would I come to that conclusion? By experiences in my life, my path, like I just explained now, you see. Extraction of meaning through experience and walking your own path. This isn't an exam, what's going on in the world, but it is the same. You have to start recognizing how things are different, but the same. Pattern recognition, the energy, the understanding, the wisdom of that has helped me with what I'm doing now. It is the same in many ways. That is where true knowledge is. I'd learned that previously too in another way about time. In first grade, at least when I was a kid, we had lunch tickets. I don't know what they do now, but we had paper punchable lunch tickets. And so every week, one kid in class would be designated the one to hand out the lunch tickets. So me and some of my friends had this contest. How fast could we get the lunch tickets handed out to everybody in class, right? So they did their thing, and they all had their time. Then my week came up. The first day, I was all raring to go, and as soon as I got those lunch tickets, boom, I'm just flipping through them, looking for people, trying to find them as fast as I can. They're running over to their desk, looking for the next person, running over to their desk. And after that, I beat the time. I had the record time. The second day I did it, I was within like 10 seconds of the first day. But because I'd already had the time and I thought, well, gosh, I'm going fast, it occurred within me to wonder about something. I wondered, how fast am I really going by exerting this much effort? First grade. I realized the only way to find that out is to go really calmly and slow as if I was just doing it normal. So on Wednesday, I got the tickets and I slowly went through them was clear when I saw the name and walked over to their desk, looked at the next name, walked over to their desk to give myself a control, you know, the regular speed to see how fast I was going. So I walked through the whole thing. When I was finished, I beat my other times by almost 30 seconds. Then I had a new wonder, a new question. Why did that happen? Why do you think? Because I wasn't in a panic. I may have ran physically fast from one desk to the other, but when I was going through the names, my mind was chaotic and cluttered. I wasn't resolving the name and resolving the person's location in the room as fast as I was when I was calm. So the whole thing together happened quicker when I was calm. Just so you understand, if I can extract that just from my life, do you think it's possible that a social engineering agent or a mind scientist, propaganda agent, knows the same thing about the human mind? 
that when it's in fear, anxiety, or panic, that it cannot think, it cannot retain. Do you think that might have something to do with how they're flooding you with all of this stuff about the New World Order, mind control, FEMA camps, all at once, and using fear? Do you think they may know that your mind will lock up and you won't be able to put two and two together? Is that a possibility? I just want you to consider that, okay? Look at what Alex Jones does with his movie Endgame. By the time you're done watching that, where's the solution? You're overloaded with things that you are not ready to hear, and you're not in the right state of mind to hear it. When I saw that, I applied all of the lessons that I've extracted from my life and the knowledge and I'm doing what I'm doing now. What is that? You see, I learned pretty quick. I was guided by my spirit to correct my errors. You see, when I first came on YouTube, well, when I first came on, I never planned on putting videos. Uh, the only re see, people say, what does Adam Pants mean? There's no meaning. I have a friend named Adam. One day he <laughs> he made he needed to make a uh, a username for something. I don't know. I'm sitting in his house. I'm like, come on, come on, just come up with something so I can send you this link or whatever. I think it was email. He couldn't think, so he's just looking down in his lap. And then all of a sudden he types Adam pants. I'm like Adam pants. He's like, yeah, I'm Adam. These are my pants. So I started laughing. That made me laugh. Well, I think I wanted to send somebody an email or make a comment. And I couldn't think of a name either, and I never thought I would put videos. I didn't think it mattered. So because I couldn't think of a name, that made me laugh. So I'm like, okay, Adam Pants. So I just put that there, and then, then it stuck because I put the first video up under that name. But there's no meaning in that. I mean, maybe synchronicity of life, maybe Adam and Eve, now we're Adam with pants. I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, that's where that came from. Anyway, my first video on YouTube was me experiencing anxiety. I knew how much I knew and what I was aware of, and I knew that the people that would be listening to me didn't know, and I knew that part of what they didn't know was that which would keep them from paying attention or believing what I'm saying. It's not that I couldn't make them understand, but I knew the control over beliefs and the mind was strong enough to get them to turn away from the video before I was able to show them. Meaning, I knew I could explain it. I knew I had that ability. But I was very anxious because I knew I could feel that a lot of people would turn away from the recording because of their laziness, because of their lethargy, their low attention span, their preconceived core beliefs, the rolling of the eyes, their totally programmed minds. Before I could show them that they're programmed, they would click off of the video. And that put me into a huge state of anxiety. And so there was a lot of good information in that, but it was also, number one, the recording quality wasn't very good, but in the beginning I was just bitching and bitching and bitching because I was angry, and I was angry at the future. I was angry at knowing that a lot of people wouldn't listen. I was worried about whether I was going to fail or succeed. Do you understand? And that inhibited my expression in the moment. As I was taken through my path, many lessons were quickly shown to me. What is a lesson other than putting two and two together in your own life, in your own path, and your spirit will do that for you? Just be mindful of the truth you feel inside. I've grown a lot since I first came on YouTube a year ago. What I would say now is not what I would say before. Not that what I said before isn't valid. It was valid for progression. But I calmed down because I realized that was it. I remembered the exam. I remembered the lunch tickets. I remembered how the mind locks up in anxiety. I started reading all the books because I did do my research. I had read hundreds and hundreds of pages of Fritz Springmeier, read four of David Icke's books, not to regurgitate them, but to see what was being said to people. I realized when I read The Biggest Secret that that was a very traumatic 
book. Fritz Springmeier stuff is very traumatic, and I knew people better than the people giving out this information. I'm not saying that David Icke's intentions are bad. I think he does a great job speaking. He gives from himself. But there are things that I know. I know people. I am a very sympathetic person to both sexes. I know people, and I know the mind from my own experience, not from a book. And I thought, wait a minute. These people need to be enabled first. Because if they're not enabled, perhaps they didn't put two and two together from experiences in their life yet. If they didn't do that, and they're going on a superficial meaning basis, they're fucked. I knew that right away. Holy shit, they're going to be... Wait a minute. And then I started understanding anarchy. It was just a huge red flag. So I stopped, recalibrated, and went back to the beginning. If people are not enabled, then all of this information will paralyze them. And I told you that in The Healing Begins Now. How am I going to enable you? Well, I'm following the path. Again, I'm not really worried about whether I fail or succeed. I don't have a particular objective in mind. I don't have a particular goal or an outcome. Because that's the end justifying my means. And I won't allow that to happen. I know what people need. They need to learn to extract meaning from their own life. And it can happen, but here's the deal. The brain, if it's going to rewire itself to accommodate that type of thinking, reason and logic and actually pattern recognition, the brain will have to rewire to accommodate that if you're going to do it in conscious awareness. That takes some time. So I have to catalyze that process and be patient. That's why it's almost a year later now. I have a lot of knowledge to share, but if I just went bleh with everything I know, if I truly cared about you, then by doing that, I would be hurting you, which would be a direct contradiction. You've got to take the whole picture into account. It may suck to have it take this long, and that may be excruciating to wait for people to catch up. But if you truly care about them, that's what you're going to do. So I know what I'm doing, kind of. I want to... I, I will give opinions that I've extracted from my own life, yes, but I will always, if you notice, show you how I reach that. And the way that I show you keeps you from, try, from trying to copy it. At least I do that the best I can. I think I've done a decent job as one person trying to address many people. And I'm not strategizing too much, because if I'm strategizing with what I say, then I inhibit the flow of my speech, and then it's not as authentic. So I speak. I speak as I am. I teach how I teach. I'm both a student and a teacher. And what I'm trying to teach you is how to learn from you. How to handle pressure based upon lessons you've already gotten in your life, whether you remember or not, I want you to remember. I want you to go back and find it. It may take some time. You've got to be patient. You can't play guitar right off the bat. The results will take care of themselves. If you express yourself with the proper means, you will have the correct illusion of an end. Do you understand that? If you focus on the end, your means will get screwed up. If you focus on the means, meaning have faith, that's where trust comes into play. Faith in your instinct, in the expression of love. If you believe that love is the superior consciousness, then you have to trust it. You have to extend faith to your spirit, to the truth. Love is interchangeable with truth. People misunderstand that. They've been misled. It's not their fault. But they have a belief. They've maybe heard me say something about unconditional love. But the problem is that people have a belief that unconditional love means unconditional fluff. 
Try substituting the word love with the word truth and then say it. Unconditional truth. Love doesn't go around and act fluffy duffy. Love does what's appropriate in any given moment. Sometimes you may seem to be rude to somebody. Why that was needed you may not know. But it knows. Trust love in the moment. So I had to make a decision. I cannot control my experience. This I understand. I cannot control what happens in my reality. My mind may affect what happens, but I really have no control over it. So what do I have control over? What I give to it. How I perceive it. When they say, he who overcometh, what is it that you think you're overcoming? What is the ego other than submitting to the collective input you've had from your reality since day one? That's the ego. This idea of dismantling the ego completely is wrong. I use my ego all the time. Personality's still there. I'm not a moron. I know how to interact. You're not going to lose your mind unless you're part of some cult that tries to brainwash you. When I say the ego is the problem, what I mean by that is believing that you are your ego. For to believe that you are your ego means that you have allowed society to tell you what you are in a prison system. And that's wrong. Your objective is for you to tell society yourself what you are regardless of its input. That is what honesty is. Where you express yourself, how you truly feel, what you know, regardless of your reality. You are not where you are. You are not what you experience. You are the experiencer. If you let your experience change you and tell you what you are, then you become the experience and that's how you get caught in the web. If you're constantly running from pain and chasing pleasure and think that that is somehow your identity, you're in the web. This is very important. Very important. You can't change what happens to you. In the sense that your ego does create your life here through the law of karma and the law of attraction, which is an imposition on you, by the way. It's an imposition. It's wrong. Stop watching The Secret. It's wrong. Anything you want to manifest out of the ego is just an accident waiting to happen. It's only a matter of time before you impose upon another's will and they know that. When you manifest out of love, love takes priority. It will manifest correctly whether you understand it or not. So your mind creates your reality. So if you're just mind ignoring input from spirit, you can potentially create very bad things. If you submit to the truth, which is what it comes down to, people, it's not falling on your knees and worshiping as some enslaved servant. Serving God? What? You don't serve God. You wouldn't be without God. Serve God? What? You wouldn't be without it. Women, do you have a child? Do you go through the whole process and give birth so you have your child worship you? Is that your motive? Do you make your child contract to worship you and bow down five times a day to you? You know, here's a good example of what I want to invoke in you with your understanding of why patience is a virtue. Now, I'd taken just a 10-minute break to go do something. I went driving and I came back. Now, in that 10-minute period, to tell you what went through my mind in five of those 10 minutes would take me about three hours of linear language, of linear speech. This is crucial, and this is why patience is needed. 
what happens well if all of that comes into your mind you get overwhelmed right because you see things broader and compared to how you can speak it it's overwhelming it's kind of like if I had an Adobe ebook that you read with the Acrobat Reader and say it's a 20,000 page book now I have a memory stick and I can just plug that into your hard drive copy and paste it onto your hard drive once that's done you have the information it took a few seconds to transfer it and now you have 20,000 pages of information but if you don't have a CD or DVD burner you don't have an internet connection and you don't have a memory stick or a floppy disk or anything like that you have no way of transferring that information other than reading it word for word to somebody else or having them read it the method in which you will acquire information when you extract meaning from your own life and as you get better and better your brain gets more efficient with it the method in which you do that is not the same method in which you have to use to communicate that information people get locked up they're overwhelmed they end up criticizing you because of their own anxiety it's not that they don't want to tell you I bet there are people that are part of these secret societies like I said before they're like ah that's it I want to tell them and they suffer consequences if they try to do that and if you roll your eyes at them or they get overwhelmed because you don't want to listen to the whole thing because you believe you know that makes them hate you even more these people a government agent doesn't have time to extend patience it's not that they wouldn't want to tell the world I bet there are a lot that do I bet there are but they wouldn't know where to begin and could they extend the patience over time knowing that they would be interfered with in ways that you don't know and they do know when you break adherence to <laughs> certain frequencies you see things that you never would have thought possible this is why I laugh at people one one guy sent me a message and says is there a clear channel we can communicate on a safe channel I send him a message back I'm like what do you mean a safe channel he says you know where we can't be detected something safe <laughs> those in the know laugh at that those who think they're in the know but aren't in the know have no idea why we're laughing you won't understand this in the way that it is but I will tell you this there is no private communication some of you are thinking technology <laughs> look um, even your thoughts if you're targeted are not private and I'll tell you something that's a very liberating thing actually if you learn from it if you know your thoughts can be read why would you lie and here's the interesting thing this is why if you adhere to the truth regardless of source just the truth that you feel it can't be beaten they can invade your mind but if you adhere to the truth then you see that as liberating it's like the balance game you know where you stand in front of somebody and you put your hands up and you try to knock each other off balance you lose that game two ways either you get pushed backwards but if you exert too much force and push forward and fall into the person off balance forward you also lose somebody with correct balance can get you to fall into them or push you backwards and that's the thing that's why mind control isn't what you think it is if they do it too much that'll propel you to the truth if they do it too little you'll naturally go to the truth if they scare you then you choose truth over your life if they entice you then you learn from the enticement if they can invade your mind I see that as a good thing because if they're gonna to listen to my thoughts that means they have to consider them I welcome it I welcome people listening to my mind because I'm not pretending to be perfect they can learn from my corruption and learn how I'm trying to overcome the corruption how the corruption is being overcome 
You have no privacy. The sooner you realize that, the better. If you adhere to the truth in you, what have you got to hide? The only way you would hide that is if you fear the judgment of other people. Or if you feel that your body is more important than the truth itself. Remember, adherence to observable lies or adherence to unobservable truth. Faith. But not faith in some objective God. Just what you feel is right and true inside. What gives you the most joy? Stick with that. Keep it simple. So it's bizarre, probably, for some of these mind control agents and entities. Because I actually welcome their observance of me. I feel like I'm on that show Big Brother, where I'm under 24-hour surveillance. That's fine with me. I don't know exactly why. I just don't care. Other people say, I had a black helicopter follow me. Yeah, I had that a year and a half ago. I waved. They're not going to follow me around. And if they do, I won't care. They know that. Why? If they follow me around, I'm a good enough communicator to make people take note of that. Quickly. See, usually they know that it takes too much time to give somebody the truth. With me, I can take a person and very rapidly make them understand. In person, anyway. Because they'll have to assess me and my energy. There's more than just words, people. Why aren't there agents sitting in a van across my street? Why do you think? Because I would go right out of my house, walk up to their van and say hi. If they're going to follow me, then I'm going to have them talk with me. I don't care if they're there. I'm going to make them think about it. Why are you doing it? Is your perception narrow? What is the purpose in what you're doing? Why covert? Especially if I'm willing to talk with you. Is the purpose of trying to make me fearful and anxious meaningful? Are you deviating from your path because you're allegiant to something that is forcing you to do so? If you had your choice, would you be my friend or the friend of somebody giving you orders? Be honest with yourself. If they want to sit and watch me, they're not going to do that because they know I'm watched. Because they know I know I'm watched. Remote viewers, astral travelers, the whole deal. Why are they going to do the van thing? I already know and they know that I know. And because they know I know, that wouldn't be as effective as what they're doing to me. What they're doing to me is what they do to people who don't care about what they do to the people out of the know to scare them. And they can't really peg me as somebody in opposition to them. What are they going to say about my recordings for people? What? That they're wrong? That my message is negative? I'm teaching people to be alive. Seek the truth from within to recognize their own value. That includes a government agent. If a government agent is listening to this, that includes you. And you know I feel that. What are you going to say? Especially if you know how corrupt my mind was in response to certain forms of mind control and how hard I'm trying to bring out the love and spirit in me in the face of that. What are you going to do? Come on. Criticize me for it? For trying to heal? Unsolicited? Actually motivated to heal what my mind thinks it wants? and I'm still doing it, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? That you don't respect that? Do I know that a lot of them are under mind control and they're very narrow-minded like everybody else? Yeah. I would imagine it would be hard for them to attack me because I address them when they do. And they know that I know. In fact, I even had a government agent turn on a microphone and speak into my head once. He said, look, I know you don't want to get involved and turned off the mic. 
he wouldn't do that unless something that I was doing and how hard I was trying and how neutral I was trying to stay in the face of it, I somehow, in some way, earned respect from him because I don't even know the full capabilities that they have. He wouldn't have said that to me because I don't want to get involved. I would prefer to just teach to be in a world where I could just help people with their path and gain joy from doing that. They know I don't care about this New World Order shit in the sense that it has no meaning to me. I see it as an inhibitor, something that's getting in the way of truth, but I don't care about it and I don't lust after it. They know that. So what are they going to say? What are they going to do? What? They won't do it directly. What do you think? Some FBI agents are going to come to my door? They wouldn't want to put up with that because I would sit there and I would talk with them. The only thing they could do would be to beat me up. And I don't know that they necessarily want to do that. I mean, really, let's look at what I'm doing. In spite of their agenda, I'm doing an awful lot of healing. You've got to be an evil motherfucker to attack me for what I'm doing when I didn't ask for it I wasn't even seeking it what do you think I was a conspiracy theorist I wasn't I had my own business I had my own life I was seeking spiritual knowledge of self and accidentally discovered this stuff because of the knowledge I attained and they know that it was an accident I wasn't seeking it it's just a situation where I can't turn away from it now that I've seen it. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Act as if everything was the way it was? It's just a matter of integrity, man. I don't like addressing mind control. I'd prefer to not be in a world where I have to do that. I don't get excitement from it. But I can't... It's kind of like, ah, fuck... You know, you look at it and you're like, eh, no one else is going to be able to, I, I don't know, that's how I perceive it. It's like, I know the abilities that I have, and they tried to rip my mind to shreds right in the beginning. I haven't talked about that yet. They tried to rip my mind to shreds so that I would end up in a mental institution. What they did to me, I'm sure, is what they did to Kurt Cobain and anybody like him, yet somehow... It didn't have an effect on me. I actually took meaning and understanding from it. Again, the truth. Because of my adherence to internal truth, I didn't give a shit that my reality changed, and that was probably bizarre for them. I mean, how are they going to approach me? Hmm, he doesn't have any shame. We can't blackmail him because he'll embrace any corruption we reveal about him. We can't... Let's see, he knows about the entities and the mind control, and he's actually looking at it sometimes as an interesting experience. What are we going to do specifically? Because he actually engaged us. I tried to call the FBI over a year ago. I didn't get a. Re I, did, I left a message, no call back. You think you would think they would send a psychiatrist or something for good measure to check on my personal safety? <laughs> no. That's why I sought out an ex-FBI agent. This is what I talked about in that interview during uh, Propaganda Parables and Perception. I would love the opportunity to sit down with these people. You think I wouldn't? And they know that. And when I did it, it wouldn't even be about their agenda. Because that's not what I am about. That's not the experience they would have from me. So, I mean, if I could do anything, if I could get the people involved with this agenda to consider their own path and what life is about outside of the control they're under, I understand that it's overwhelming. I understand you agents are shown things that seem hopeless. If you are allegiant to your body and your life in your body, I don't care if you've seen other realms, I don't care if you've been shown the abyss, the nature of this reality. You believed this reality once. Just because you were shown something new does not mean that that is the truth. But the consciousness that guides your thoughts in a sublime fashion 
controls how you perceive the new reality and how it should affect your point of view. You see, <clears throat> anybody that has their veil lifted this way are buffered from society. They resent society because that which lifted their veil also controls the people and will set up all the time situations where they encounter people whereby these people reinforce their hate for them by acting stupid, being aggressive, showing how little they know, in a way that is offensive to the particular personality that is controlled by this consciousness to carry out the agenda. Making them not want to help, extend patience, or anything, but actually resent the people because they magically forget that that which is giving them knowledge is the one making those people act the way that is offending them. See, they're not seeing the whole picture. You talk about an entity, and so an entity is giving you knowledge, and then you come into contact with people that seem very stupid to you once you know certain things. And they'll say things that just happen to irritate you and make you want to shake your head at them. You never take a moment to think, wait a minute, I hate these people. Why do I hate them? Well, they're stupid. What made them stupid? Oh yeah, the same thing that lifted your veil. You got to trust me on this. To maintain secrecy, threats are not enough. They have to make the person hate the, quote, sheep. Do you understand? They coordinated that well. These people try to do that to me all of the time. Those that have listened to all of my uploads so far will understand what I'm about to say. Those that just started listening to this will not. And I won't answer your questions about it because I address this in other uploads. I get questions like, say I'm thinking about UFOs one day and suddenly I get a bunch of email reinforcing me to seek information about UFOs. Isn't that interesting? Or I'm thinking about something else and the emails I get are somehow related to that. Or I think, well, I can't be judging people. It's not their fault they're stupid. And then I suddenly get a barrage of emails of really stupid comments. Hmm. <laughs> you think? You think? Maybe? Just maybe? <laughs> anyway, those of you that have listened so far all the way through everything I've done, you know what I'm talking about. Um, this is very true, and you have to be mindful of it. Remember, polarity. Just like they try to control you with Star Wars. Right? A Sith thinks only of themselves, and a Jedi is selfless, right? Creating polar opposites. A true spiritual person may appear to be like a Jedi, but that isn't right, because if you're selfless, you hurt the system. Why? You're part of the system. So if you're only giving, and you're selfless, then you're not receiving. If you're only taking, then you're hurting the system. Truth would be you have to sustain yourself as part of the system, and the system. Both. Selfish selflessness. You have a right to joy. See, there are two energies. The energy of disease is an energy that takes in anticipation of being taken from. The energy of health or normality would be giving, knowing that you receive. Two very different energies. One's pathogenic, one is diseased, one is normal. Here, people are hybrids. One pops up sometimes, but they're primarily dominated from the former, taking in anticipation of being taken from. What's the difference? One is duality, one is singular. I may use giving and receiving, two different words, to describe the energy I'm talking about, but that is an illusion because true giving is the same as receiving. There is absolutely no difference. You cannot give a true gift without simultaneously receiving. And you cannot receive a true gift without simultaneously giving. They're one. One cannot happen without the other. Forget about direction. That does not exist. Understand that is normal creation. That's it. 
That's the nature of true reality. You cannot give without receiving. Now, you, if you apply that here, not from the ego. The ego can't do it. It's something you feel that happens. All you can do is change your ego so that it's more receptive to that input. But when it happens, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody deserves that. So I'll say I was a giver that is here at this time. Who am I giving to? Everything. And that includes the takers. See, here's the interesting thing about a taker or a detached energy. It cannot receive. It will not receive. Can't do it. That's why it takes. When you understand what receiving truly is, you'll know that a taker cannot do that. And because it's unable to receive, it cannot perceive what a giver is giving. The taking energy is trying to convert givers into takers. Part of that is keeping score of your behavior. Sublime mind control to you throughout your life. Propagation of norm-based ridicule, if you come into awareness of that, utilizing a pseudoscience called psychiatry, or anything else in the media. Humor, comedy is the number one vector for mind control. The sigh of relief, of laughter when you jolt yourself back right into the center of the norm. <laughs> the point, I'm going to give. I have no target. I'd like takers to be something I give to. Because you cannot take what is given. That's why they try to convert you into a taker. Something that is now in guilt and shame and fear. What you give cannot be taken. Love can't be taken. It can only be given and received. It's a different bandwidth. It's a different, it's a different thing altogether. So it's not like I'm being leached if I give to a taker. Because the giving sustains me. You don't run out. I don't have a goal, but it would be nice if some takers actually allow themselves to receive. When they receive, they will see that what they receive is so far above what they were trying to take that it's not even comparable. One is alive, one is dead. If you're taking in anticipation of being taken from, you are dead. If you're copying the norm, letting meaning be given to you, rather than extracting meaning from your own path, you are dead. You may be able to move around, you may be conscious, but you will be consciously dead. That's what, like when you hear Christ say, let the dead bury the dead. I'm not talking about a corpse burying another corpse. Those who are consciously dead and don't get it embalm and preserve a body put makeup on a body cemeteries subconsciously promote worship of the body it's a severe sickness okay I can imagine a branch of a tree bending down and dwelling on a dead leaf that fell off rather than allocating its consciousness to new leaves that are sprouting let the dead bury their dead what is raising the dead other than getting them to adhere to truth that they may not be able to readily observe because their own extraction of meaning from their own path begins to make them reject the lies they can observe. You must begin to extract meaning from your own life. I don't care if half of your conclusions are laughed at by people in the beginning screw them you're trying don't ever ever let anybody discourage you from that the more you try to put two and two together the better you will get you will learn to do it quicker if you look at your path what do you think the narrow path is other than extracting meaning on your path it's a narrow path because it's your path. As soon as you get sucked into another's path, you're on the broad path. And that can come in many shapes and sizes, from sex and drugs and propaganda and all kinds of things to distract you away from extracting and learning from your own path. I'm talking about observance. Maybe you're an artist and you've painted several paintings. You've put them away somewhere. Go back to them and look at them again. 
Look at journals you wrote ten years ago. It's all right there. It's all right in front of your face. This does not mean to ignore your reality, as your reality is part of your path. You'll find that when you, I should call it give-receive, <laughs> re-give, it's one thing, but when you give and receive, you'll find that's where you feel alive. Guys, maybe you're socializing and you see a girl that you're sexually attracted to and you could go along the path of trying to persuade her to see you as sexy and to consider hanging out with you, getting her to do something, in other words, taking. But if you stop that, if you're on that wave, jump off the surfboard, and ask yourself, what does she need? I'm a guy, I know how guys manipulate. Would it help her spirit if I actually took the time to listen without any strings? What if I did that? What if I actually gave her eye contact and let her know, hey, not all guys are bad. You don't have to have sex if you don't want to. Don't ever let anyone put you into a state of feeling guilty because you won't put out. Having sex is only stimulation of the body, which is chemical. It's a detached drug. Remind them, what's the difference between having sex and making love? Having sex is body worship. It's a stimulus of the nervous system. It means nothing. It's to reach a chemical high. Making love is where you try to stimulate the spirit inside of the body. What if you actually used your intuition for something good? What if you saw that maybe she's attractive and gets hit on all the time and all she really wants is some sort of authenticity because it's so lacking in this world what if you thought about that and then followed through sat there for a half an hour and don't fake listen to her be direct with your thoughts as long as they're giving it'll be okay see a lot of people think that being blunt and direct means you're being honest just because you say what you're thinking doesn't make you honest. Why? Because what if what you're thinking is a conclusion that you reached because you were in denial? You were filtering your reality. You're basing your conclusion on lies, whether you know it or not. It's a faulty conclusion. Therefore, it is a lie. It's a lie to your spirit. Just because you're thinking it and you say it doesn't make you honest. But if you're in the state of giving knowing that she is a valuable being. Forget about the sex and just think about that. Pretend she's your sister, guys. Or your mother, that you went back in time, and this is your mother when she was young. How would you treat her then? And then follow through. After a half an hour of advice, say, nice meeting you, and walk away. No, hey, can I get your number, even if she asks you for it? You don't need to create a relationship. There are seven billion people on this planet. You're already in relationship by being alive. Giving has no strings. Men, listen to me. Walk away with a smile. Don't do it robotically. Don't try to copy the behavior. Have the correct intention. As you walk away, you've given the greatest gift. Wow, that guy didn't want anything from me. Then you'll see it's not a taking energy, and you've just raised her spirit. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Now, remember, I said you cannot give without receiving. If you do something like that, and don't go seek out a girl. This is one scenario. There are many ways to give to many different types of people. Please do not be mechanical and robotic and like a cyborg as you hear me give you a scenario. After you give like that, when you walk away, take note of how you feel. How bright is the sky? How colorful are the leaves on trees? How beautiful do the birds sound now? You cannot give without receiving. And then I want you to ask yourself, 
what if I took my normal approach? What if I tried to act cool? What if I was strategic about things I said in anticipation of how she would perceive me when I said them to shape how she views me? What if I lived a lie? What if I tried to take advantage of the situation because I wanted a date? Would I feel, and be honest with yourself here, would the bird sound as beautiful to me right now? Would I notice what I'm noticing right now? Do not try to think about what I'm saying right now because you cannot. You cannot imagine it. You cannot recreate it. This is something that has to happen. You have to follow the path. Then, and only then, will you be able to take note of how you feel. Don't try to anticipate how you're going to feel because you can't. I'm just telling you that after you give, in any way, a true gift has no strengths, has no motive, isn't premeditated, isn't calculated in the brain, it happens. Why will it happen? Because if you're in the state of love and wanting to know thyself, you will be positioned into a situation that will allow you to do it. I am absolutely 100% sure and certain about that. Don't ask me how, just trust me. In other words, you don't have to seek out the situation. Do you hear me? If you truly want to know yourself, I promise you, you will be put into a situation where you will be allowed to give. You will not be forced to give. You will have your free will because that which will put you in that position extends free will. Do you hear me? You must understand step by step rehabilitation. If you want to know thyself, part of knowing thyself is giving because what you truly are is a giver, whether you can remember that or not. If you intend to know yourself, which is a derivative of God, before you can know God, you have to know yourself. They're one and the same. You will be put into a position, all day long if necessary, where you can give. If the next day you rebel from that and want to take, you'll create a position where you can take. You create the cancer, love will create the healing. The template is the same. What you experience in this template is not. And be mindful of that. If you want to know of God, the more you do that, the more that you're going to find that you're put into these positions. What's doing that? And once you start to learn and extract meaning from these situations, when that salient event happens, you cry. When you know God, you'll know God. <laughs> and you cannot be told how you're going to know God. And that's individual for each of you. You can't know God by hearing me. All you're hearing is an expression because of God. I want to finish up by talking about this give thing, this give and take thing. Like I talked about before, a taker is a detached energy. It is a disease. It takes in anticipation of being taken from. A taker deludes itself. It lies to itself. It justifies its own existence. It believes that it gives. How? It will strategically allow itself to be taken from as if to justify its own existence. You must understand, giving and taking, giving and taking, remember, these are not a pair. Giving and receiving are one. Give and receiving. Give, receive. Taking in anticipation of being taken from. For example, let's talk about just energy. Think about an extrovert. People are deluding themselves when they think an extrovert is a giver, they're an entertainer. No. They leech your energy. An extrovert, a social butterfly, needs to suck your energy out. They drain you, and that's what gives them their vitality. This is why a lot of rock stars are really quiet until they get on stage. They're sucking your energy, it's your energy that's animating them. 
they're addicted to social situations because they're dependent, like leeches, upon the attention that other people give them. Attention is giving energy. In introverts is the opposite. They are vulnerable, more vulnerable than the normal person, to having their energy leached from them. They get into a social situation and they feel their energy just leaving their body. They may not understand it that way, but because they're so attentive to everybody and everything, that's why these people are very descriptive writers and whatever. Because they're very detail-oriented, they're very attentive. Because of that, they get overwhelmed in a social situation. They're way too sensitive to it. They are attentive to everything and because their energy leaves them when they're that way, because they're not in observance, they're attentive, they're, it, it, the reality can take their energy away and that weakens their aura and then they're very sensitive. They feel out of place, they don't, they're, they're just too awkward because they're having their energy taken. An ambivert is somebody who toggles between the two, depending on their current state and the situation. Now, most of my life I was an ambivert. But when I feel the spirit strong in me, when that happens, that's when I am not leached and I am not leeching. My passion will be the same. My vitality, my energy, my emphasis is the same whether I'm talking to one individual or 500,000. It wouldn't matter because the energy at that point is coming from somewhere else infused inside so coming within I can relate to takers because I was converted to a taker in a lot of ways in this lifetime and that's very important why you've heard uh, he who overcomes I'm not going to speak in old English what you were told is he or she they always emphasize male that overcomes their reward will be great. Those with understanding. See, a taker thinks of a reward as something that happens later. A good deed and reward. Sit, roll over, and you get a treat. For those of you that are waking up to your giving, as I am, and that is a slow process where you start to remember that you enjoy giving more and that's where life is, that's the essence, the unquantifiable essence. Ask yourself some questions. When you're in the state of giving, you receive simultaneously. And there are many of you that know what I'm talking about. So your reward is simultaneous. What is that reward? Describe it. <laughs> yeah, good luck with words. Secondly, say for example, maybe you were somebody that is here at this time to heal. What is the motive of a lifeguard when they jump into the water to save a swimmer? What is the reward that the lifeguard gets? Let's not even do a professional lifeguard. You're walking along the side of a river and you see someone in trouble. Without even thinking about it, you're already jumping in the water to save them. What is your reward? To one who overcomes, the reward will be great. If you come in as a healer and you acquire the corruption, they know you're a healer, you have a different uh, energy about you, so they're on your butt. The moment you incarnate, your life sucks. Everything's coordinated around you. Low self-esteem, probably abused as a kid. Uh, you have perversion, maybe addictions, all of these things. However, now you can relate, can't you? You can relate to the taking energy. It's just like somebody who's sheltered and mom and dad keep the kid spoiled they get everything they want, they have an easy life, and they decide to study sociology and psychology. And they think, what a great thing it would be to become a guidance counselor and help troubled teens. 
the problem that they run into that they're completely oblivious to but the young teen is not oblivious to is that they have no credibility with the teenager the teenager knows right away that whoever is trying to give them advice doesn't understand they didn't go through it themselves they didn't overcome anything they are not qualified to give advice they can't relate to them they don't know what it's like they're just not qualified to give advice and you know that you know that if you're looking at the prissy counselor that has had everything handed to them you can't take them seriously you resent any advice they give you because you know that they probably wouldn't be able to handle what you've already gone through and it's a direct paradox it's a contradiction well if you come in and you acquire unknowingly which is why it's credible and then you overcome while being able to relate because as you overcome as you begin the process of overcoming that usually precedes knowing of any negative control on this planet it certainly did for me I wasn't a conspiracy theorist like I told you before I had no idea I thought that was myth I thought that was a joke but it was essential that I wanted to repair myself before I knew what was around me for me for my path it's important because my motive came from within me then I was shown but the interesting thing is as I go through this process that okay at least I understand what it feels like to be a taker to have those desires I may not be as intellectual or have the mental capacity as the scales higher than me that are running this show however the energy is the same I can relate to it and if I overcome it I am credible the same way that a troubled teen would be credible if they became a guidance counselor the same way that Robin Williams was credible to will in goodwill hunting it's almost identical relating is so important even though they still try to entice me and corrupt me and hurt me well that's expected isn't it I mean if you go up to a drug addict and tell them to quit they're gonna hate you and they're gonna try to justify their addiction then they're gonna try to offer it to you if that doesn't work if the fight doesn't work and hurting you doesn't work they're gonna try to get you to do it doesn't the alcoholic always want to pour you a drink misery loves company why they're trying to justify their condition because they're frightened they're frightened of the unknown which is why they use the unknown to scare givers givers are in a situation of amnesia taking uses fear and threats of the unknown to scare givers if I were to give you one certainty in all existence I would tell you this never anywhere any when should a taking consciousness be in control of a giving consciousness and if that happens that is certainly a state of disease regardless of scale it is disease one who overcomes will have a reward that is great what reward do you think that is if you're a guy what is it you think you're going to get a pretty girl in the afterlife a virgin what's motivating you now if you're a giver the physical world is that what gives you your passion that may be equated with pleasure in a polarized state of being to detach from pain but what gives you that passion like I was talking about where you're in that state that you would have the same enthusiasm whether you were talking to one person or 500,000 someone's looks getting laid getting high making money people that get excited about money are not passionate they lie to themselves and say they're passionate they're elated they're manic 
if your motive is the simultaneous receiving as you give what do you think the reward would be what is the reward if somebody jumps into a river to save a drowning swimmer what is the motive to do it if you have a friend who's a drug addict and you try to help them what would your reward be if you overcame the problem if you can come into this realm recognize what you've become see it in a mature way a broad way and forget about the judgment of other sick people which is essentially all of mankind and overcome it even when they try to stop it blackmail social persecution pain if you overcome that what's your reward why'd you come here why are you here why is the spirit doing what it's doing why why does a giver give what is your reward jewels you can have a Porsche in heaven what money you're gonna be rich in heaven food what what is it you think heaven is what is it that you think is going to be a reward bow down and receive your reward and they open the box what's in there What material thing could you be given that could even match the motivation of sacrificing yourself to help? What's the reward? Why make a sacrifice? Why did Christ sacrifice himself? they didn't sacrifice him and it certainly wasn't to please some deity like it's sold to certain groups they can justify the story and, and believe the lie all they want why would anyone do that what was the sacrifice when you say I've made a sacrifice today I sacrificed my time I sacrificed this and your motive can't really be traced to the ego why would you do it what do you think Christ was concerned with the opinion of human beings who do you think he was trying to motivate you are all subjected to that which his sacrifice was for in other words it was a way of saying hey you have a severe problem do I enjoy this torture you're imposing upon me would you be able to withstand this torture you're imposing upon me can you trace my motive to my ego why would I be doing this how important are you you have a disease and you're comfortable with it right now and you're hurting me badly how important do you think this is now if you're still in a taking energy you don't care any more about that than a mosquito cares about hurting you you don't even consider it so what would the return of Christ be what do you think that man and that personality is going to return do something smack you all up give you a big spanking what how about the realization from within what the value of life is and when you truly know what the value of life is you will know that it is irrelevant of scale therefore one being is as important as the whole when it is realized 
what that man actually did and any like him that did the same thing and why why when the taker finally realizes and receives that gift the gift is timeless when it receives the gift forgiveness is the wrong word except if you really look at the word for I give when a taker receives it is also a giver when it's on that wavelength it has knowledge when it has that knowledge it understands when it understands it will metaphorically collapse metaphorically cry it will be in awe of how how could it do what it has done and be forgiven what in the world has that type of capacity and it will realize that no taker should ever be in control of a giver that's enough for now thanks for listening